it'll be start that that police force will start to be used on doctors that fail to comply with um, ICD-10, ICD-11 um, requirements coming out of uh, a CMS up in D.C. And if you start doing that, you're going to start calling because they're going to start calling them fraud if you code your um, uh, um, if you don't use one of the 68,000, the proper uh, code out of those 68,000 codes coming out of ICD-11. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's just uh, it's going to be used as a um, weapon of intimidation, and uh, I'm, I'm, I was very concerned about it. And I, unfortunately, I think I was the only Republican that voted no on it. That's the really scary thing, Senator Colbeck, is when a good man like you goes into the machine, you get consume just like everybody else does. There's a machine that we can't seem to break apart. And, and oh, they don't see it. The machine doesn't consume me. It just spits me out sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. How much time do you have on the floor to, say, um, use that bully pulpit to try to teach your fellow legislature that or legislators that we need to stop this government Make it come five to five minutes every session. Yeah. See, and, <laughs> wow. Uh, how is that going to work? How many people there, Patrick, or excuse me, Senator Colbeck, have the same mindset that you have that you want limited government, and why can't we accomplish it? Uh, that's difficult to nail down some days. Mm. I, I know we got a lot more folks over in the House that are of that mindset, um, and uh, I try to work with a lot of them as well. Yeah, but I see that a lot of those conservatives voted for this tax increase road bill. Uh, I, I believe, um, uh, I, I hate to list names when I don't know them for sure, but I, I have a feeling that Brandenburg voted for it. Um, I know Marty Nolenberg on the Senate side voted for it. He's supposed to be a conservative. I think Jack voted against it. I know Marty voted for it on the tax side. Well, I was surprised um, to see there's a number of House uh, representatives that actually voted for it, and uh, they're supposed to be the more conservative. Uh, oh, no, well, Jack and Marty are in the Senate. Uh, well, uh, yeah, okay, I'm sorry. Brandenburg is in the Senate as well as I know M M Marty is. Um, but in, on the House side, there were a number of conservatives. Gary Glenn, for example. Gary Glenn voted for the tax increase proposal. And well, you would only – the House had a – much more constrained version of it that was down to, I mean, I, if you can say, I, obviously I oppose all tax increases, but it, they were in the mode where saying, hey, I, I'm going to try to meet you uh, a little bit of the way, and they went, as, instead of a $1.2 billion tax increase, they went as high as 119 I think. Yeah, we don't so want a tax increase at all. In the grand scheme, I mean, that's relatively good if you're looking at the House numbers. I don't know. I just uh, don't like the thought of a tax increase at all. I'm glad that you agree with me. I, I'm with you. I, I know. <laughs> Believe me, I'm with you. You know, I have I, a little uh, bit of trouble on the board here, but we do have a caller that would like to ask you a couple of questions. Bruce, Bruce from Gross Point. Let me see if I can get him on the line with us. Bruce, are you there? No. Nope. Bruce, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Oh. I, I heard a I heard a click, and then there was a couple of se seconds of silence here. But <laughs> uh oh I hope I didn't uh, you, you disconnect Senator you Colbeck. Senator Colbeck, you, are you with us still? Oh, yep. Oh, good. Oh, good. All right, Bruce, go ahead with your questions. Okay, great. Um, first of all, uh, Senator Colbeck, uh, thanks a lot for everything you're doing. It was, it was, it was, in fact, it was great seeing you at the Joshua's Trail fundraiser back, uh, back in May. Uh, you, you gave a very good, uh, very good presentation. What I wanted to ask was, what, whatever happened to the idea of using the interest, like you were talking about, from the Michigan Catastrophic Care Act to, uh, you know, to, uh, to go to the roads? Uh, whatever happened to that? Um, you know, before my next question, uh, whatever happened to that, uh, that idea, did that just kind of die in committee, or was that even presented as an idea, or what? Uh, I think uh, Representative Pete Lucido has been a strong advocate of that, and I, mm -hmm. and I put it into a portfolio of ways that we could uh, fund the roads with existing revenue. But right. it hasn't gotten any traction right now in the House, and uh, until they get it out of the House, I can't really push it too hard in the Senate. But uh, it's... Um, it's definitely one of the options that's, that should be considered. Um, right. Just a lot of people, it, it gets a little bit more complex with, it, with that particular issue because they're looking at the no-fault reform, and sometimes when you have too many uh, moving pieces going on, mm -hmm. so we're trying to reform it, and then we're also trying to take money from it, it kind of limits your ability to reform it. 
Man, it's, it's kind of like having it's kind of like having a, one hole spring in a, in, a, in a dam, and as soon as you put your finger and plug it up, another one opens up, isn't it? Well, yeah, and then yeah, and then very the, much so. <laughs> I feel like the little Dutch boy a lot up there, though. <laughs> the opposition says that that is just a one-time fix. That is just a one-time fix, so it's not a sustained, well, lasting. The interest, if you're just using the interest off of it, you could have a sustainable. Um, you know, revenue stream from the interest. So that, right. that is something that could be more than one time. And then yeah. if they would take a look at your quality-based road fixing plan, which talks about uh, a, a better quality of road construction that then would, uh, you know, alleviate the need to keep repairing pothole. Yeah, that yeah. yeah. wouldn't that be back. nice? Not only does it cost less money, but you wouldn't see those orange barrels as often. Yeah, yeah. It, would, it would cost less money over the long run if they actually had roads that, that lasted more than, uh, what, two or three years. You know, you're having to go back and fix the same pothole twice. Yeah, well, that's, and that's sometimes what... Sometimes more than twice. That's what Senator Colbeck's plan uh, consists of. There's two other parts to your plan. Uh, mm -hmm. One is to reprioritize spending. Um, do you have specifics on, on that? Yeah, in that, if you go to my website at morningmichigan.com and you click on that quality-based road plan, um, there's a series of tables in the back there, four of them. They include all kinds of different options on um, how to reprioritize existing funds. I mean, part of this is a moving target because it, it, the, the reprioritization is a function of each budget year. Right. So you've got to go through, and uh, that's why Senate Bill 414 we were talking about when it says we're going to take $700 million of the G, uh, general fund revenue, put a box around it and say, that's going to be dedicated to the roads. That gets rid of some of the um, dancing um, from year to year. The first year is the one where you get into specific reprioritization of existing funds. Though. And once you do yeah. that and you fence it in under that restricted fund blanket, then you can move forward and uh, and other budget years just knowing that $700 million has already been uh, targeted towards uh, roads. Of course, right. then again, big government lovers will just say, well, we need $700 billion for another project then, because guess what? <laughs> Our kids are not getting good education. <laughs> no, 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 they certainly aren't. And, and, and the second, uh, second one, I think, is uh, of a much more serious vein. Uh, we just now uh, have, have seen with the, uh, the refugee crisis over in Europe and uh, how the Obama administration wants to, uh, wants to import as many as 100,000 of uh, uh, refugees from Syria by, uh, by next year, I believe it is. They want to do 10,000 this year. And uh, the governor says he wants Michigan to be a welcoming, welcoming state for these people. Well, you know, it's, it's a terrible thing what's going on. That these people are, are being forced out of, their, out of their home countries and, you know, because of ISIS and, you know, Al-Qaeda and all these other terrorist organizations that are doing it. But, you know, what we already have, uh, the, I think it was uh, earlier this year, we already had, uh, uh, I'm not sure how many of these uh, uh, these, these, these folks that came up uh, through, me through the southern border through Mexico and have been resettled in Michigan. I'm not sure how many of them. We don't know where these people are, uh, you know, how we're, how we're paying for their support and all this. So what's going to happen? What, what, what is going to happen when these uh, Syrian refugees get here? Are we going to know their backgrounds? Are we going to be able to, uh, you know, to, how are we going to support them? Um, and are you guys in the, uh, in the Senate and the, and the House uh, on the Republican side, are you guys doing anything to, to, fight this, uh, to fight this influx that Snyder wants to suddenly, uh, you know, suddenly come, in, come into, the, into the state? Great question, Bruce. Thank you so much for your call. We'll look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, Senator Colbeck, give us an answer to that question. What is yeah, the state legislature doing to stop the Obama administration? <laughs> the short answer on specifically the subject of refugees is that we're doing nothing right now. Mm. And as far what, as about, what we should do yeah. is, if we're going to bring in people, I want them in, into some sort of a holding facility first while we can vet them. And because uh, a lot of the folks that I'm seeing right now as refugees are not the families with their little kids. It's the. Uh, it, it almost looks like we're importing an ISIS army into the United yes. States. Oh, that's exactly, <laughs> exactly right. right. And in fact, Senator Sessions said that ninety percent of the Middle Eastern refugees get some form of welfare. Some form of welfare in in fiscal year two thousand thirteen. Ninety one point four percent of Middle Eastern refugees accepted in the U S. received food stamps. Seventy three point one percent were on Medicaid or refugee medical assistance, and sixty eight percent were on a cash welfare program. What is it that we're trying to accomplish? Um, 
a good question. <laughs> I, uh, I can't defend that, but I did go off and highlight that um, one thing that's not helping our situation that I talked about last week was the uh, Iran deal. And uh, I, if I could just for a second, is if we're talking foreign policy, um, one of the key things we need to do is stop this Iran deal. The Abolitionist Roundtable invites the Wham Talk 1600 listeners to continue the roundtable discussions by mailing correspondence to Art of Michigan, Post Office Box 135, Garden City, Michigan, 48135. Or follow Phil and Dell at artofmichigan.com. You can also send emails to artofmichigan at hotmail.com. And most of all, continue to listen every Saturday and tell a friend.